Dear Mr. Nordhoff, I cannot describe my mood when I learned of your departure. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir. Es würde mir zu Gewissheit. Gottes Wille kennt kein Warum. I accepted it as fact. God's will knows no why. Ich wollte tapfer sein, das Unvermeidliche tragen und doch musste ich unterlegen. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, aber es in Ihrem Interesse liegt. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. Dear Miss Laube, our correspondence has reached a point beyond which it can only be advantageously conducted if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other. And this condition forces me to decide whether I, for the first time in my life, should trust a person with things that I have heretofore kept for myself at the very depths of the shrine of my heart. Wir leben in einer schweren Zeit. Trug und Schein verhüllen die Wahrheit. Alle Menschen tragen irgendwelche in hard times. Swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity show up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed, if one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true and noble. May 4th, 1938. Esteemed Mr. Nordoff, please pardon my conduct, but I must address this letter to you. I want to ask you a great favor that you grant me a chance to talk with you. I must speak with you. I take the opportunity to send you my best wishes. Yours truly, Hilda Lauer. A P.S. I apologize for the lack of return address. I, I would not like to create an embarrassment for you. situation, but you must be able to understand me. I am not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir announcing that you had 
except to the teaching post in another town. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. I must unburden my heart to someone, and the person whom I unconditionally trust is useless. And so I ask you, Mr. Nordoff, tell me if you can help me. Dear Miss Lau, your confession has shocked and agitated me. The past few days, I could barely write down a thought. I did not spurn your love. Rather, I did not know of it. This is what has preoccupied me these last few days and every few minutes, and what I have thought over and over again. It is not always easy for me to formulate my thoughts and words, and they can always be easily misunderstood. I want to be gone from here. I cannot bear life like this anymore. Because I love you too much? It hurts so much when one must repress what is barely blooming and always show the world a calm, friendly face. But deep inside, my heart constantly wretches and hurts. Tell me, have you any time in your life loved someone so deeply and then fate intervened with a rough hand to remove them? In spite of all of my education, in spite of all the challenges I have faced, I have preserved a childlike belief in, in pure love. And I thank God for it. My brittleness, my reserve, and my cool politeness. Many people per perceive this as repellent and offensive, but they're a defense against the ugliness and the invasive intrusions that seek to destroy this faith. I am not offended by your reserve. I dislike the way in which so many other girls my age lead their lives. <laughs> Most of them love reeling from one pleasure to another. I do not the slightest find it conceited and snooty when one segregates oneself uh, from them because one has the will to better oneself. You asked whether I have already felt this pure love. Yes. I have fallen quite in love three, three times. And I know that it was true love. I didn't declare myself and I pushed back my emotions because I still wanted to pursue my studies. And I believed that at the time, things had not yet come for such things. When one is young and healthy, there is nothing more beautiful than learning. To explore the world with all its mysteries, to enrich one's knowledge not with empty, base things, but with things which are necessary for completing, completely fulfilling the duties assigned to us by life. So as to not fail when challenged by tempestuous times. Yet I know that our relationship is not allowed to be because I am not of the same status as you. What could this mean? Does your family bear some inherited burden? Do you not come from a respectable family? In your reply, please dispel the doubts you've raised on me? Oh. I am most certainly descended from a completely honorable family. I grew up in a home as the only child and was not forced to do without any of the things that were necessary to make me into a, a real, proper, striving human being. Still, I have had to forsake my greatest wish for material reasons. When I graduated from my program in home economics, I wanted to become a baby nurse and perhaps other a kindergarten teacher. But my parents did not have the money for that. So after spending a year working in the household of my current boss, I transferred to his clothing company. If you take the trouble to arrange things better and still see no enduring success, then you grow faint-hearted and would rather do nothing. God is the one comfort that can save human beings from despair. You should not hold me for a bigot. The word of God does not easily fall from my lips. I, I often consider whether I have the right to write it here and there. My nature is such that I cannot accept something sight unseen. I must examine, and investigate, and come to my own conclusion. That's how it has been with God, and I still have not yet come to a conclusion. 
I was able to identify with your description of man's relationship with God. Yet I will admit only after I read those lines twice, for I never did. I never tire of reading your letters again and again. It is as if I have finally found a peaceful place after all my trials and tribulations. Everything is written so simply and truthfully, and yet every sentence has a deeper meaning, a purity, a, a power emanates from his eyes. We live in hard times. True coon shine swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity shows up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed. If one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true, and noble. I often entertain the desire to immerse myself in issues which have nothing to do with everyday life. Um, but I have too little self-confidence. I fear my girlfriends will misunderstand and ridicule me. In short, I lack a guiding hand. I do not speak of these ideals with, with arrogance. No, I speak of my own experience. I see the ultimate meaning of marriage and two people finding their way to God. And do not take it as a slight, but rather a concern for happiness when I now say, examine yourself. In all honesty, pray unto God that he might give you the certainty as whether it is pure love that besets you. The yearning. The yearning for a person who could be everything for me. Who understands me, who teaches me to fathom everything good and beautiful in life so that both, as you so beautifully expressed it, can then strive together with firm faith in God to become more real and more complete. This yearning never died in me. Now tell me, please, whether it is that your interests, uh, that, that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. I will not have it, have it if it is charity that leads you to me, but rather your honest, for you will. In matter to love, I will not let myself be cajoled by my parents. And I will only negotiate with the person who similarly stands before me, who does not seek to ensnare me with deception, and who does not bring other people into play, even if it's her parents, to capture me prematurely. No, she has to want to get to know me, closer to me. To examine everything with me in all seriousness, although it also means courageously confronting the possibility that the examination itself thwarts the wishes from which it sprang. In matters of love, I want to act freely. In rendezvous, you are becoming an experienced traveler. You can already read the train schedules, only very few women can do that. You dash from one train platform to the next. Dear Mr. Cohen, this afternoon you were supposed to meet me in Golsar at 12.15. Now, perhaps we would have been taking our first walk through town. It doesn't bother me though, I'm just so happy since I know you've recovered from your illness. I very much enjoyed the pictures. I would like to keep all of them. Only one image has too much empty sky. The poses are very lively. Women always understand better how to place themselves in the right light. And, if I did not know for whom you sat laughing so gracefully as a model, I would actually be jealous. Your girlfriend captures your harmonious nature. Your, your, your carefree cheerfulness reminds me of the way we sometimes felt during choir practice. Mm. Oh, oh, um. I, I just remembered that. I couldn't have taken my vacation at your boarding house. I know a family who has 
has been spending their holiday there, they would be really puzzled if they had run into me, and it, it's fine if we meet in Dresden on Sunday, but only if you're healthy and happy. Do you hear? I'm thinking about how strained our encounters have been, how you cause the whole of my person to become tense. The expectation, preparations, trip, and introspection of oneself and the other, all of that taken together is a great excursion. I think that you still miss living here. I value this part of Germany. It's my heimat, the place of my childhood and my youth. Even though it's industrialized and it has its own charms, which some don't appreciate at all, I'm happy that in the time that you spent here, you grew to love where I came from. It is too bad that we do not live nearer to one another. But, who knows if we would have grown closer in that case. There are a number of obstacles, you understand, that were eliminated once I moved away. I believe the distance is good and happy. I just read about the girls in the labor service, and I was very close to volunteering. Imagine, just last Sunday, I wore such a uniform and it fit like a glove. An acquaintance of mine, she is in the labor service in Brandenburg, she likes it very much, except for families or farmers with lots of children. <sighs> no, I'll get over it. Um, are schools being evacuated in your area as well? There are soldiers being quartered everywhere. What does that mean? It means possible war with Czechoslovakia over the Sudetenland. Last week I was urged to travel to the Reich Party Conference in Nuremberg. One cannot just flatly refuse such things, so I declared myself prepared to go there as a civilian. And then they told me that accommodations and board would be in tent camps. <laughs> that is not for me. <laughs> as I continued to consider how I could free myself from that snare, I received permission to withdraw. I'm counting the days until our parish festival. How long? I must confess, my girlfriend Louisa, now that was the person with who I'm secretly meeting. Uh, now, I had to tell her after the last time we met in Dresden, she was gobsmacked, as we say. I got her to promise not to tell anyone, and I'm also not worried. She has up to this point not disappointed me. And now! You rather be a trip to Dresden with your co-workers. It's also canceled. Just as well. We would have had to pretend to be strangers. Perhaps we would have played these roles with secret pleasure, but it is better that we did not have to do so. We should meet privately this coming Sunday at the usual time. I'll return your pictures to you. <laughs> I appreciate the way you uh, helped me get to know the other side of life. How should I thank you? Um, I know only, though, want to get to know the joy in your life. I want to share your worries and your pain. If, if you have full trust in me, let me be your comrade. Teacher, perhaps, a comrade. As you know, I am a person who reckons realistically. I, I only wanted to approach a woman once I had something to offer her. As far as I know, until the long holiday in 1937, I was not guilty of any glances your way. So, tell me, how can I believe that a young woman without any encouragement could lose her heart to a man 13 years her elder? It was late summer, 1936. Do you remember that night? We left home that evening from choir practice home. As we were walking alone, you probably arranged it that way. You gripped my hand. I wanted to pull it away. At our parting, a confession sprang from you, from quivering lips, dark and uncanny, with a clear, deep voice. I heard you leaving. I think you. I cut off me. your speech with a calming word. No, I could no longer think of choir practice without you. It was. It became soulless 
the evenings. Still, I said to myself that a love could not be between us, because in contrast to you, I am a poor girl, both in a financial sense and in education. Well, I'm sorry that I did not listen to you, that I did not already offer this young, burning heart a little relief. I, I, did, I did not want this outbreak of emotion. I feared it. But the memory of it does not need to be embarrassing for you. I, I recall quite clearly that at the next dance, I coaxed you with many a light word to avoid stirring up the past. Well, you know, I, I tried to forget. I made new acquaintances indiscriminately. I visited amusements. I wanted to steal my silly heart. I worked, and then, then came the, the reflection, disgust. And I felt my heart yearning greater than ever. I don't know if it was charity that brought me back to him. When the rest of us were also married, he would often stand there with an extra expression on his face that often portrayed anything but Marion's. I often wondered if he bared some awe, if he bared some secret grief inside. The memory of our encounter stood under the gloom of the following days. Every evening we listened to the news, German and foreign. Everyone was fairly agitated in our little town. In the evening, the radio reported the mobilization of the English Navy and the armies of Belgium and Holland. Things stood on the razor's edge. On Wednesday, we made the air raid shelter ready for use. Our landlords, more scared than we were, stored the most important things and did not sleep Wednesday night. On Sunday morning, 8 a.m., we had a civil air defense exercise. A testing commission rifled through the whole house from the cellar to the attic. Our local teacher took the lead, blowing powerfully on his whistle, and that was a signal. Everyone who could run, down to the shelter. And when I turned the corner, there was the mail carrier. Well, hello, Miss Love. I bring something special for you on your dark path to the shelter. We turned bright red. Thank you for saving me a trip to the mailbox. At school the next day, I was particularly impatient while waiting for your letter. Quarter to ten, there was a knock at the door. The mail carrier, a congenial old man, with a beating heart, I took the letter and slid it into my left side pocket, striving at the same time for an indifferent face in order to offer it no father for childish curiosity. Then came the hard test of my self-control. Not to open the letter until I was back home from school. The men in the stairwell all looked at one another with knowing glances and laughed. For the time being, I stuck your letter under my dress and exhaled. The exercise was successful. We received praise and encouragement that we should all prove our worth to the same degree and real emergencies. Everywhere there were preparations for the worst case scenario. Then came the report of the meeting of the statesmen, when you were as happy as kids. In no time at all, a half pound of bonbons for Mother's birthday were empty. This much was clear to us. Those four men could not depart Munich without coming to a solution. I considered in all seriousness traveling there to bear witness to this historical turning point. On Thursday, I visited my brother, the soldier in Laval, stationed there fully equipped and ready for battle. He wrote to us today from Kraxo in Bohemia, which means that he took part in the invasion of the Sudetenland. Oh, it's like I've been jinxed. Today is Tuesday, and I'm still writing this letter. Yesterday, when his grandmother came to visit, and I had to quickly pack away my things and writing materials so she wouldn't notice anything. This week, genealogical research kept me in suspense. I mustered all of my acumen and zeal to acquire the birth certificate of our great-great-grandfather, Gottlob Nordoff, and his credentials as a tailor, which I had tried to do before in vain. My dear, what are you writing there so intently? Uh, grandmother, it's nothing. Just family tree. 
Uh, could you help me with it? Oh, I have all those names written down at home. There's something charming about investigating the clues of one's ancestors. These details could be useful. Grandmother pointed to me and my aunt, who sent me a genealogical chart for military service. I find it very interesting. I now have 23 images of you in 23 letters. These letters provide me with an image of you that is much clearer than that of the photographs. When I wish to be glad of our friendship, I reach for the letters. Last week, I read all of them, again, one after the other. Your last letter was the 25th that you had sent to me. You must now think as the male, as an appreciative friend as well. I said it once already, one cannot write everything, and some things can only be written. The, the two of us have grown closer through the letters and then through personal interaction. After all, we have only met one another four times. Just to count back. On May 4th, I first dared to write you. After we had lived for almost two years next to one another, like, like two ships passing in the night. Among all of these letters, the second holds a special place. It, it reached me on the 13th of May, ripped me out of my equanimity into a wild carousel of emotions. This letter has grown in value the more that I grew certain of your seriousness for your inclinations. The friendship finds us now. I would like to bring so very much sunshine to you who stood apart for so long. <clears throat> um, I'm of the opinion that you were folding your letter pages incorrectly. I confuse you. <laughs> uh, if I want this on the inside, uh, then three must also be. Whenever I read your last letter, I always got caught on the wrong side of the second page. Still, how intrepidly you kept up with this correspondence, how clever, how Judicious in the dwarf you are. I admire uh, time and again how you understand how to make everything so exciting. If I only lived in the right environment, I believe that there was so much I could observe and learn that I would not have the time at all to be dissatisfied. For some time now, I have been looking for a closing line to my letters that is to some degree more heartfelt. I have noted your use of best wishes. Very best wishes is stylistically indecorous. When I read your letters, I, I never skip over the formulaic salutation at the end. Quite the opposite. My, my gaze rests on it a while longer, and then wonderful thoughts shoot through my head. Your Hilda Lava. Your Hilda. My Hilda. In um, each of your letters, I sense a great, good heart and a loving, true soul. I, I have to be fond of the author. But I think, at least for now, you will excuse me if I have not yet offered a more cordial closing salutation. For that reason, I can only extend to you, once again, the best wishes of your Roman Murdoch. Sphere, but there are only a few people who purchase such loans, and they read them in order to acquaint themselves with great men more precisely and from all angles. We know Frederick the Great from school and from the history books as the glorious Prussian king who fought three wars. In his letters, we come to know him as a dainty, sensitive person, a broody, divided nature. My dear Roland, Will you have time to visit me again over the holiday? I look forward to our conversation and to hearing more about this companion with whom you are corresponding. Yesterday, I met with a former colleague from my old school. We discussed politics, art, science. 
You do not need to be jealous. He is around 68 and looks a bit like me. <laughs> People used to take us as father and son. Uh, I'm not jealous of your fatherly friend. Uh, quite the opposite. I'm happy that this man has been there for you in such a way that this valuable friendship has been preserved for all these years. When the two of you walk together in this way, I would love to play a secret observer. We talked about wives and marriage from three in the afternoon to ten at night. We did not come to the end of the topic, nor to any conclusion. But this Hilda, she comes to you with the riches of a prior love. While you, Roland, you come poor with distrust and doubt. You cannot do otherwise. That is probably a man's way of doing things, to examine everything carefully first. It is a safeguard, for once you have said yes, you must stay true to it. He seemed to me to be an inveterate bachelor. I will not marry. I would prefer not to say that with such certainty. Can our lives not be improved by living together with another human being? Shared love is twice the joy. One truly recognizes oneself only in another. And these reasons I must allow. But do you know any marriages that are like that? How does it work in reality? The wife only wants a child from the husband. Then she is satisfied. She has no further need. She cannot honestly follow the man in his world, so she has to pretend. That would be discouraging if that held true in all its gravity. The wife wants a child. That is her nature. She loves the husband as she does her child. She cares lovingly for him as well as for his well-being. But the man then becomes her puppet. Or a doll. And then he in turn becomes a more, and many men are comfortable in this world. <laughs> I do not wish to share your pessimistic view. The wife does take the place of the mother for the, for the husband. That is natural. Love of children and motherliness are the central characteristics of a feminine nature. But I hope and believe that the woman can also participate in the world of the man in her own way. The older I get, the more I see that my father did my mother an injustice. He knows nothing other than his work, fulfillment of duty, and his creature comforts. Certainly I realize that his right arm was injured in the war, leaving his hand lame, but he lacks nobleness of heart. I even have to ask him to go to church now and then. Across the world, Wherever something grand has been or will be created, the man is at work. The great works of art, higher thought, and everything that elevates life is the work of men. The man builds and creates, that is his nature, a creator's nature. Is it not a divine celestial nature? I mean, my father should not be allowed to neglect his family left life as a result of his work. My mother certainly suffers from it, and she bears it silently. Otherwise, my father's the best human being. It's just, he comes home from work, so exhausted from labor, and it leaves him with no energy, and to say it blatantly, it leaves him soul-destroyingly dull. The arts of the wife, are they not merely the arts of seduction? The senses of the wife, are they not merely directed towards the terrestrial? They are of a lower nature and contrast in celestial of the man. And that is how many cultures perceive. The wife not only seeks to hold the husband back from his world, but to pull him down. It's not uninteresting for me to familiarize myself with various opinions on the matter. Ah, just the same, I wouldn't dare contribute to this conversation from my humble experience. To take this position with conviction does require more uh, worldly wisdom. Certainly. The woman is of a different nature. She does not create like the man, and her thoughts perhaps do not fly so high. Is she therefore a lower nature? Did, did God not create both so that they could complement one another? <laughs> I do not completely understand your friend, Mr. Roland. Do you not catch an echo of a hefty portion of egotism? <laughs> Does the woman not create a harbor in the home for the man? A, a place of rest that he gladly seeks out after his travels. Does she not often encourage the man to any creation? Is the work of the man conceivable without the woman who gives life to his sons? Many important men remain unmarried. Many find no satisfaction in their marriages. 
Is that not evidence enough? <laughs> I would like to put out one more thought. Man says, the nature, mother nature, that is, he experiences nature as something feminine. Uh, your friend openly announced his aversion for the feminine, yet his opinion contradicts his behavior. How often, Mr. Rowland, have you seen him speaking or walking in the street with um, feminine creatures? It may be for the sake of his profession, but don't you remember how we said he would like to marry, but uh, girls are too addicted to uh, frivolity? But you have to understand, it, it is a real boys club for two. When he and I walk through the neighborhood, the, the neighbors sometimes stop and gaze at us for surprise. We are often even in conversation, and sometimes even wildly gesticulate. From time to time, though, I need and love this. Oh, well, I do not believe in the opinions of him. Let him find his ideal woman, and then come back to you for a conversation. Fair enough. I, I do cherish this friendship, um, but I'm also yearning for an interaction with, with a woman. A, a tender hand, a, a loving glance, a heartfelt word. How I have missed them, and, and for so long. And then you wrote to me that, that first letter, you asked me. How have you ever truly loved a person from your heart? With that question, and that confession, you touched a deep, divine pain. It was the key to my heart and to my trust. I, I was forced to tears at that point. You wrote to me of some secret pain that you've carried inside for so long. Do I have the power to console you? This pain and it extends back to my sixth year of life, perhaps further. My father may have behaved carelessly. My mother divided her love, and she did not give it to me wholly. From that moment on, a distrust emerged between me, father, and mother. I no longer believed in their love, and avoided all tenderness, and was alone. Please, place your trust in me. I would like to help you bear it. You shouldn't have to stand alone in your suffering. It was this distrust that made it hard for me to approach curls. So it must be fate that I won the friendship of a girl that, like you in such an uncommon way. Only two people and the whole world know about our friendship. I'll guard it, like an exquisite treasure. How long will this disagreement continue to have an effect on us? You have nothing to blame yourself for. Your Dora, my soldier. We both made errors in judgment, but is it not to be expected? Our friendship is still young and not yet public. If you were to leave me today, or you were taken from me, I would be prepared for it, no matter the pain. I would get over it, I would come to terms with it on my own way. Earthly love is not the highest estate. Inclement weather. It's so very gloomy. It even governs my mood. I used to get scared of thunderstorms when they got bad. Uh, I went to the stairwell, sat down on the stoop, and sat there quietly, hands crossed, resigned, thrilled, and prepared to get most that lightning would strike me. I didn't go to church today. Also, the choir did not sing. Fourteen days are almost gone by since we saw one another. The impression fades. Fourteen days are still to go till we see one another again. Oh my gosh. Everything has become so agitated with regards to the political situation. In Chemnitz, the, the Jewish temple burned. And the fire department
government didn't intervene, only protected the surrounding buildings. The worst danger seems to have been prevented. Since Tuesday, 200 young men have been sheltered in town, refugees who allegedly comprise a militia. They are in civilian attire, have no weapons. They conduct military exercises in the athletics field. Came back yesterday. The impact of what he saw over there still has a very strong influence on him. While marching through candidates, I marveled at the attacks perpetrated against Jewish shops. But the worst danger seems to have been prevented. Were these campaigns taken in, in every town? In many. All over the Reich. One would like to hope that these restless months may someday be redeemed by calm years of security. Still, it would have been better if you had been straight with this young man. You could have said, you may gladly trust yourself to me, but I already bound by my word to another, to another friendship. Oh. That would have cleared the air. Oh, dear. No, I didn't want it to happen this way. When I read your letter, I realized with fright that I put our friendship in great danger. And I'm honestly really sorry. I, I'm sorry that I've hurt you so badly, dear Roland. The only concern that I took home with me from our last meeting is Dora. I am utterly convinced that she recognized me, and if she had not seen me clearly, she still sensed me, and not had a good night's sleep since then. Now I'm always thinking of you and her. Dear Hilda, I know Dora only from a distance, just like you. So true love could also not bind me to her. I, I am a difficult man. I did not make it easy for you and would understand all too well if you came to doubt, but, but the fact that I have entered a contract which binds me gives me a certain resilience and confidence. I look at Dora with fresh eyes now. After I read your letter on Sunday, I directed my attention twice as much, but inconspicuously, in conversation with others, or when she believed to be unobserved. I thank you for telling me about your interactions with this young man. I can reproach you for nothing, though. You would not have the right to do so. You acted in good faith. I no longer find melancholy in Nora. In fact, she was so loving to me a few times during choir practice that I was ashamed. I have to always remember how much pain it'll cause her should she learn of our friendship. Fate is quite often harsh. Is there not any way for us to move forward? In politics, it's called a ceasefire in your non-aggression pact. Both sides commit themselves to enter into a new friendship without prior notification until the expiration of the contract. This contract neither compels nor subjugates us. It just stops us from going our separate ways after the first misunderstanding. Please, believe me, I didn't mean to deceive you. The type of friendship that connects me with you can never happen between me and, me and him. I don't have any respect for him. He's not yet... He's not yet a man. Then why did you not mention our relationship? Uh, we only spoke of his military duty, his future career as an officer. Uh, I admit I show interest in that, and he may have interpreted my interest differently. I am grateful that you are writing to me about everything. Why did I mention our relationship? Except for my girlfriend, Louisa, I had not yet told anyone about us. I wasn't concealing it just from him. But now he will write to you during the rigorous time of boot camp and cling to you. Now that you've explained everything to me, I realize that I was at fault. I want to make it right. I would not want him to think that I'm cowardly by trying to clear all this up. This confusion with a letter. I'll tell him the truth, face to face. He'll most certainly have a furlough over Christmas. I can speak to him then. It is good that our conversation turned to our prior courtships. I assume that you are no longer conceding anything decisive for the continuation of our friendship. No, nothing else. And I won't ask you any more about Dora. I know it's improper for me to be too inquisitive. It is rude. 
Nosy. By the way, Mother made a wreath for Advent. We sat together, all three of us, in the uh, twilight hour. I showed mother and father, not without heart, heart politicians, the two photographs of us in front of the boarding house. <laughs> Did you receive the small wreath I sent? Uh, don't be mad, but after you told me that your house was bare, I just... I couldn't bear the thought of you being deprived of the anticipation of Christmas. If you would permit me, um, I'll come in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you are coming to visit me, you say? Um, <laughs> a young woman, no figment of my imagination, a real young woman in the flesh. For the first time, I will have a visit from a lady. <laughs> Uh, please don't laugh if I make a clumsy mistake. Well, we'll be in each other's company for 48 hours. That means a step towards greater familiarity. I'm uh, approaching this full of hope. I, I view my apartment as an office with a place for me to sleep. Uh, now I have to clean it up with a little make it a little habitable, <laughs> buy a few more things, and we can also do some very these few days before I buy. Uh, you know, if you tell your landlady that your guest will be arriving under the cover of night, she'll probably be a little shocked. We can meet in a neutral, uh, anonymous place. Uh, a rendezvous should not be foreshortened, uh, or, or for, uh, foreshortened our freedom to the side. Mm, no. I want to see where you live. Walk the paths that you walk. We may be secretly observed, but from then on, it'll always seem as if I'm walking with you. Our encounter will not be without its allure, uh, adventurous and yet not haphazard, so secret, yet nothing forbidden. Mm -hmm. To observers, will seem full of freedom, exceeding the limits of propriety, but we'll stick to the rules of our arrangement, of course. And none other than my mother will be the one to pick me up from this adventurous rendezvous. Mm -hmm. I would like to eavesdrop him too, if you had to make your way home from the train station. Here is how I paint the picture. Hilda, on the arm of her mother, quietly striding a half step ahead, coaxing her with many quick words to cheer her and disperse her, her, her cares. Yeah, my mother, uh, concerned, discreet, Incorruptible. Takes careful note of each tone, each lilt of my voice to hear whether her daughter was well behaved, whether any discordance has taken place, whether I'm trying to hide something. It would not escape my mother's chagrin. I am so glad that we have the consent of your parents. I, I credit them highly in their broad mindedness and allowing you to visit me in my home. I, I take it as an expression of great trust. Uh, but, but what if the train stops running because we'll win a storm, or, or worse, what if a political crisis happens? Is our relationship not more important? Well, it is no less important. Let us hope that world history will not disrupt our personal history. On Sunday evening, I arrived at the train station and climbed back into my reality. Christmas vacation is like another world, a carefree world of rest, dreamland. Yet, after it is over, when Father has to return to work, then you sense it. This dreamland is not a reality. My parents' house is simple, and we move about only in our working class circles. I sometimes feel anxious that you won't feel comfortable when you enter my parents' house. You belong to my world and my reality, dear Hilda. My, my thoughts turn to you more frequently now. I, I have no one else. To, to place your hopes on a young woman, on your best friend and comrade, 
That is no doubt an earthly human kind of hope, but it is the most beautiful and valuable on this earth. And the more I build on this hope, the more the days seem worth living. I can hear the loud music of the National Socialists outside my window. As they march, where they're going to listen to the Fuhrer's speech. Although I fancy that I'm a good National Socialist, I consider it more important to write to you and listen on the side. Now, I have to contradict you. Hitler's speech has to rank above my letter. I'm twice I thought, where will she be sitting when she listens to it? It was Hitler's best speech, yeah. But, when I have to attend party meetings, I, I feel apprehensive. I cannot breathe under the eyes of all these straight-laced conformists, club enthusiasts, and powerful office holders. The thought that participation in Nazi events would mean that I have to spend time with them affords me no small amount of pain. Well, but I, I hope that none of our letters will be opened and the content read by unauthorized people. The speech has a palliative effect. It, it encouraged me to contribute a little. A, a large thread wove through the whole speech and there you go, the, it ended so confidently. I believe in a long period of peace. Last month, I received a letter from the local director of the auxiliary corps. Most Honorable Miss Hilda Lowe, we regret to inform you that the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps does not need you right now. The enthusiasm of the German folk for the defense of the Vaterland in its hour of need produced a temporary oversupply of labor. But we would welcome your response, guaranteeing your preparedness to reply at a later date. How Hitler! After carefully thinking about it, I respectfully declined. Uh, dear Roland, I decided that it was the right thing to do from your perspective and mine. Last weekend, I went to the office of the district school inspector to remind him of my existence. I am still not vested, that is, I am a regular bureaucrat, but not yet firmly employed. The district inspector was extremely nice. Most honorable, Mr. Mordoff, when it comes to promotions and relocations, it is true that married men who have been party members since before 1933 are given preference. But now that you have joined the party, as long as you participate regularly in party activities, I think you can hope to receive a permanent position in the village here. Hi, Nina. That does not mean that I have to live here my whole life. It, it just is my last chance to move up. The, the question of career advancement is mostly financial. Though. On Saturday evening, I hurriedly rushed home with a cheerful heart and anticipation for being able to spend just a few hours alone, undisturbed, thinking about our get-together. And then, something glimmered in the mailbox. It was a letter from the Kinnitz District Nazi Party. It was from the leader of the District Women's Nazi Association. Most Honorable Ms. Hilda Lowe, we write to you today to summon you to a meeting regarding our aid agency on Tuesday at 4 p.m. in the District Women's Association office. Be sure to bring a passport photo, resume, and a genealogical <coughs> chart. Heil Hitler! I believe, at the moment, uh, my expression didn't look intelligent. In my letter to her on December 30th, 1938, it had thankfully declined any further communication. I stood firm that I would not comply with this summons. But how can I make that understandable to these people? Then, I thought, how lucky we both now have the party at our heels. Loyalty alone, even the smallest measure, ennobles the life of human beings, to be true in service, true in love, beholding true to a thing or to a belief that one holds to be correct and well-conceived true to oneself. It's my desire to have an occupation that is equally meaningful in both body and soul, and I can no longer do that because my heart would be totally in it. 
I've made a contract with you. Being true is also being flexible in a certain sense. The opposite of loyalty is betrayal. Loyalty and remembrance is the precondition for a sense of responsibility and duty. My letter has become quite a sermon, but not an accusatory one, dear Hilda. Uh, no, I understand. Uh, one can not completely serve one undertaking. It is of our free will, both of us, that we should seriously examine ourselves. A woman's yearning is much more oriented towards being a wife and a mother than towards having a profession. You dear, sweet girl. Your loving words and your discerning understanding really made me happy. And I know that your love helped me to find the correct words to say in your part, to your letter to the party. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. No. Just think. On March 1st, my family's moving to our new apartment. Our new home is also just be a little bit smaller, but we now have five rooms and I'll have my own room. Oh, that's close enough for me. There are electric lights and linoleum covers the entire floor and don't laugh. There's even a bathroom with a flushing toilet and steam heat. You are moving? This development is taking place for us too right now. It makes me wonder where am I at home? Well, in your new home, of course. The roominess of your apartment will strike you as especially pleasant whenever your family gathers there. And the amenities in the bathroom and the kitchen will be a relief for your mother, especially. The move was only possible because of the German railroad, my father's employer, assumed financial responsibility for everything. They took possession of the apartment from some prior owners as official lodgings. Still, that means that when Father eventually retires, we will have to leave. But we've all found so agreeable that we have so much space after so many years of living on top of one another. You will be able to evaluate it all for yourself soon enough. Yes, you. Uh, um, where am I home? That's what you wrote to me. It struck me as strange. It sounds like the call of the abandoned. My Roland, how I yearn for the moment when I can have you with me and press your head against my heart tight and close and ask you to stay here with me be at home in my house. I am happy for you that the move was completed successfully. I'm especially happy that you have your own room. I, I trust that I will be permitted to view it someday. But in the company of your parents, I cannot be myself. I, I, I must put on an act as if I am a little indifferent. Am I too much of a child? To be your refuge? Uh, your Highness? Is it not true, dear Roland, that we're trying to bridge the differences in our ages? I often think how I would like to walk with you each day after work, how I could have you here with me in a few days if only I would invite you. But I, I still must set this plan aside. Understand me correctly, dear. I cannot, it cannot happen just yet. When I introduce you to my parents, I would like to be able to stand before them in complete confidence. But this meet this weekend instead in Dresden for a concert. The future is unknown. I believe in our happiness. Even though sometimes I get overwhelmed by doubt. My dear Roland, everything will be fine. You must believe in this. Sweetheart, Wednesday evening I suddenly had the feeling that you must be writing me. I could not sleep whatsoever in an evil disturber of the peace. <laughs> will you have, will I have peace from you tonight? My dear Roland, our reunion on Saturday, our walk through the snow, our small talk, these memories are so much closer and more tangible and reality to me than my daily work in the factory. Then the opera, the music of Beethoven, 
I only needed to reach out my hand and lean a little bit to the side, and I felt you next to me. I told you already, music has a strong effect on me. I'll never forget how so many different people hearken to the same tones. Yet, it felt like everything was happening for the two of us. You're right, dear Hilda. I'm scared to see you again. I imagine what you might be thinking. We were close to one another. You lay my arms and my greatest delight, you gave me your heart. There are moments in life where it seems as if time stands still. And every time that you are with me, it's like it's the first time. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> where it seems so empty and weak, paltry to express such feelings. Our friendship, our... Our inclination to one another has taken a form that outstrips the cordiality of words and letters. A glance, a handshake, a caress. They all can mean so much more than a word. But uh, your youthful enthusiasm has overwhelmed your better judgment. There's something holy about a kiss, a, a, a real kiss. It must be given from a feeling of deep inner affection. That is my belief. Until we are certain of each other, let us not desecrate this whole thing. Yeah. You are correct, of course. A real kiss cannot be demanded, and I do not want to kiss you. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I do not like to embarrass myself in front of you. You forgave me for forgetting myself that one time, dear Roland. Now, I have to ask you a favor. Be my gardener, because I need your strong hand. I always want to put my trust in you without being timid. Before, I told you, I will not let you send me away. But I will not be forced to the altar cornered by lurid necessity. Shall we stand undignified for the divine consecration? Hilda, your kiss so shocked me. It, it may be a sign of a fierce and stormy love. It, it is nonetheless a symbol of a lack of self-control. What a neglect of your duties to your parents. What a violation of duty and honor to my position. What father for monstrous gossip Hilda that cannot be. Uh, Sunday at your house. I was not a master of myself. This once for the first time, you opened the door just a crack to your reality. Hopeless and I guess I saw your tears. Only afterwards did I become fully aware of my carelessness and how I gave over completely to this Sensuality. Roland, what must we do? Hilda, it falls to me, as the much older person, to protect your honor. And you should help me do so. Don't just tremble about it like a spineless girl. The most powerful thing that holds me back from this step from you is my love of freedom and my fear of being backed into this lurid corner. What base! And low self-esteem many men of our time hold the honor of young women. You're different, Roland. You're firm in your resolutions and strong. Until now, I've worked against you, conjuring up temptation. I must not permit myself to be so weak again. I'll become hard, very hard with myself. Everything earthly separates us from God including love. And the fact that love is imperfect, that it carries within it the germ of corruption, you expressed that yourself when you wrote. Love is like a poison. I'm still seeking an explanation for how it can be that sensual love can win such power over us. Justice, truthfulness, where do we encounter them in all their purity? Where is complete <coughs> happiness? I'm alone again. The impressions of the weekend have begun to fade. I thought that I saw him sitting there. When it was quiet, I thought I heard his footsteps. When I tried to rest, I pushed my head deep into my pillow and thought, his head once rested here. But 
the past always stood waiting for me. To enter into the harbor of marriage, the metaphor is quite profound, but that harbor is narrow in comparison to the free ocean. At first, I necessarily feared finding the narrow-mindedness and the narrow background in her and her parents. Did he ever really feel comfortable with us? In the meantime, I have come to know generosity in her parents. I was so happy when she wrote that her parents lived a withdrawn life. That is always a good sign. Dear Hilda, we have recently grown insecure, unclear. It seized us. We are not fully capable of understanding its meaning ourselves. Now let's explain its meaning to each other. The first task in such a crisis is to just make it through. I would like to stand at your side. Just, just continue to hold me dear in your heart. I will find the right way soon enough. Time marches inexorably forward. I was happy that we got to be alone again. German soldiers moved into Bohemia and Moravia today, and the fear followed. A big headline in today's newspaper reported Czechoslovakia no longer exists. The excitement of the people around here is similar to the last time, and I'm sorry that my parents do not have a radio. I marvel at the caution and the consideration to which our Fuhrer proceeds, but do you believe that all of this can be accomplished without any serious incidents? Ah, I'm certainly quite silly and ignorant. Oh, dear, dear Hilda, my attitude is gloomy these days, though all of it, is too, all of it too will pass. The graduation ceremony at school was at 10 o'clock, on Sunday morning, all official with part of the corps. I was not so engaged, I would have much preferred to have taken a walk with you. What if all the sources of the summer, or even the fall? What if you get conscripted and have to go to war? We live in a great and serious era, and I will most certainly not complain when the time comes for a German girl like me, has to prove herself in the face of danger, but when it comes to the thing most dear, not one has on this earth. One does not go without a fact. I have to admit, I do not like our party politics. I would most rather think only about you and our friendship, but there's so little time for that now. I am always getting interrupted. Yeah, those words are grand. But to mobilize yourself tirelessly for your bulk, and if necessary, even with your life, to the man, to the soldier, I mean, sacrificing the most that they can for the fatherland, but to the wife, to the mother, these words are a punch in the heart. No matter how gallant their hearts may be, the women who struggle through the last war have to be examples for us. Hilda. The wish is growing strong in me to build my own home different from the others according to my own plan. When I reflect on the fact that you want to plan it with me, when I consider your courage, your goodness, your idealism, and your trust, then it becomes easy for me to say, I would venture it with you. In all of this confusion and distress, we cannot time and again fold our hands and pray to the highest that he will lead us on the right paths and give us the strength to bear all this hardship? No. The fact that we now walk this path together, it is fortune and fate, dear Hilda. Fate that, is not only, that not only means patient waiting and accepting of the unavoidable. Fate is also a task. Should we not take hold of it uh, courageously and with trust in God? All life is an eternal struggle. For the most part, each of us have to decide for themselves whether through one's hard work and participation one emerges from that struggle as a victim. And are we not permitted to look back thankfully and a little proudly on the past year? Does the packet of letters not bear witness to the fact that we have grasped our fate also as a goal towards which we are striving? I view this correspondence as the most important part uh, of the bygone year. In it, 
Have we not already begun to reach towards what we set as our highest goal? We want to grow closer to one another. Like, we were at the theater last weekend. Did you feel it? As if that magical play utterly transformed us? It reminded me of a sonnet by Shakespeare that I learned to recite at least eight years ago. You'll certainly know it. It's a story about overcoming hard times to find love. Just like us? It is true. I have grown closer to you. I've found, it, found in you a person to whom I can show who I am and to whom I show love. How does it go? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Impediments, yes. On my path through life, I certainly ran into one. A good, strong, courageous, capable girl. <laughs> you said to me so freely and frankly, Truly, I love you. Recite more. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Love is constant, that like our correspondence, these others have brought us quite close, helping us to overcome many things that divide us, like age and environment. It is like we are already living together through them, even if provisionally. Oh no. Love is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is a star to ever-wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be, ta be taken. But such um, words come hard to me. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, up till now I have uh, held myself back from saying the certain three words. <laughs> They are to be regarded as the same meaning as saying yes. When I write, I have love for you, or I really care for you, then it is a watered-down way of rewriting these three words. Love sometimes fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even through the edge of doom. These words cannot be forced. We are still examining each other. Still, I would wish to place our friendship in the right light in closing my letter today. If this era and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. So, I will write this. I have love for you. I kiss you. And I send you my best wishes. <laughs>